thank you so much for for you know the really that I I really loved your voice. I loved it. I loved it. Sort of, it was it was rough, but it wasn't rough. It was there was a grittiness to it, but there was there was heart and soul in it. I, I just thought it was brilliant. Nicholas Blake might still be afraid of the dark, but the monsters his grandmother tormented him with as a child aren't real. Or so he thinks. Until the sea freezes. The country grinds to a halt under the snow. And he finds a half-dead man bleeding out while a dead woman watches. Now his nightmares impinge on his waking life. And the only one who knows what's going on is his unexpected patient. For Gregor, it's simple. The treacherous prophets mutilated him and stole his brother Jack, and he's going to kill them for it. Without his wolf, it might be difficult, but he'll be damned if anyone else gets to kill Jack, even if he has to enlist the help of his distractingly attractive but very human doctor. Do I call you T.A. Moore or do I call you Tammy? Tammy. Okay, the Tammy. The T.A. sister all serial things, because Tammy got to be inside with somebody that writes gory stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and where are you? I'm in Newtonard, which is it's a little um, market town just on the coast of Northern Ireland. Nice. It sounds lovely. Uh, on the coast? It's, it's lovely. Yeah. It's about... Five minutes drive that way to the sea, so that's always yeah. nice. Yeah, that does sound like a good spot. And did you grow up there? Yeah, yeah. I've um, I grew up here. I lived here for most of my life. I've moved over to England and over to America for occasional wee bits, but I always came back. So. Oh, so where did here. you, where did you live in England? Oh, in Newcastle upon Tyne, which you oh. have to make clear because there's a Newcastle just down the Arts Peninsula. Uh, it's like a seaside town. <laughs> and I was going, yeah, I'm going over to Newcastle. I'm moving. I'm doing all this. So you'll not see me as much to my family. And they were all going, fancy Kai. She's only going like 20 minutes down the road. <laughs> Why is she not coming to see us anymore? <laughs> like, I, no, lived in, <laughs> I lived in Newcastle upon Tyne uh, for about six months. Um, Lovely place. My my great people. My wife had problems with the language barrier. She's uh, Julie's from New Zealand, and um, she couldn't understand the Geordies at all, and they couldn't understand her for the most part. And I can remember I worked for a radio station up there, and I was hosting an event, and it was in November, so it was near Remembrance Day. And I said to Julie, I said, "When you're in the Toon, when you're in town tomorrow." get me a poppy because if I'm going to this event, I should have a poppy on or, you know, it won't look right. Well, she went around town and she's going to people like, where can I buy a poppy? And they're like, I don't know, love. I don't know where you'd get one of them, Lee. Oh, I don't know. And she's like, and she couldn't work it out. They thought she was saying puppy. Puppy. <laughs> so oh, did, did, did you make yourself understood and could you understand them? Most of the time, yeah, because there's like a lot of Northern Irish people that have moved over there. But my, okay. um, at the university, so many kids from from uh, Northern Ireland go there. But people I was working with, they kept trying to make me say "mur," <laughs> like you know the "mur" that you look at. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. So, it, so with a Northern Ireland accent, the yeah, word. So mur. yours is more of a "mur" than a "mirror." Yeah, "mur." Yeah, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what about so, America? Where were you in America? I was in San Diego for a while. That, San Diego, really I've never been to San Diego, but it's a big naval base, isn't it? Yes, it is. My friend, Reese, Reese Ford, she um, lives there, so I was over living with her for a while. And her right. Dad. They used to have a really good radio show there because I, I used to go to the States when I was doing radio. I used to, have, uh, I used to go to the morning show boot camp where... Uh, Disc jockeys from all over America would, would meet and uh, and steal each other's ideas, basically. It's a great convention. And there was a team there called Jeff and Jer on a station uh -huh. called Star something or other. And uh, if I get this right, I think, I think what happened was 
Jeff and Joe were on a, a station called Star, and then the dial position, like 98.5 or something, Star and whatever. And Jeff and Joe left the station, and they were huge. They were a huge name on the station, and they went to a rival station. And so this, this station, Star, decided that this name, Star, is so associated with Jeff and Joe, they're going to change their name. They're not going to be Star anymore. Oh. And so they changed their name. So, of course, the station that Jeff and Joe went to in San Diego, they changed their name to Star. <laughs> so it was like the listeners just had the same station, just on a different dial position. But it was a totally different radio station. So how long were you in San Diego? Um, I was about four months and- um, two years running, so. And what made you go there? What was the what was the thinking behind that? Uh, well, mostly it was because I've been friends with Reese and Jan, my friends over there for is it about eighteen years at that point. And um, they're American. And, yeah, um, we met online. We were I was my friend Jan. She was working in um, for for a TV station over there, and she was sitting at her desk. Uh, for a long time now, I can admit it. She was sitting at her desk, you know, slacking off, <laughs> talking online. And I was at Queen's University in the computer lab. And then I met Reese. So we, we've been friends for over 20 years now. So, wow. Um, so wow. I'm going to stay with them for a while and have a really, really big visit. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bet. All right. Well, let's talk about, you know, I mean, you've had... You've had day jobs as well, but, you know, you are uh, a world famous author and you've written a lot of books. How many, how many have you done now? Do you keep count? I think it's, I think it's 19 now. That's a lot. Yeah. 19. Okay. And this one is Stone the Crows. I think, um, yes. Yes. And what were you going to say? I was going to say, I think I might be coming up on 20 with the new because I've got two coming out, one this month and one next month. So I think right. I'm, I'm coming up on 20. I'll have to check. Okay, just a reminder of your website. We'll give the website address a little bit later on. What's the address of your website if you want to find out more right now? Uh, it's tamorrights.com. So T-A-M-O-R-R-E. Yeah. Yeah, T-A-M-O-R-R-E-S. for people, yes. I'll put a link to that in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, yeah. there'll be a link there as well. But we'll remind you at the end when we, we give you uh, TMO. You can find basically everywhere I am on social media from there. So it's all Great. That's, uh, that, that points to it. Okay. Well, let's talk about reading and writing and books. When you were a kid, what was it you were reading then? Oh, everything. Anything I could get my hands on. Um, I had my library card. My granny's library card, my granddad's library card, my mom's library card, and I'd go down to a, I'd go down to the library. Um, I think my grand, my granddad used to drive me up and down, and I don't think he had ever been as glad of anything in his life as when my grand said I could, my mom and grand said I could ride the bike down. Because <laughs> I used to, no, it was um, used to love Edith Blyton. Um, all of those sort of mystery books and anything with myths and legends in it, anything with horses. The Silver Brumby series and uh, uh, the, the book about the Palomino, uh, they were just sort of my addiction. Um, and then once I read all of the books in the children's section, I moved on to the adult books because there was absolutely no oversight at the time. <laughs> Nobody had any idea what I was reading. I do. I was. I read Dennis Wheatley, which was brilliant. I loved Dennis Wheatley. Um, I was about eight or nine, so I'm reading Dennis Wheatley. Um, L. Ron Hubbard, he was terrible. He was not very good. Because L. Ron Hubbard, he was a uh, an average science fiction writer, and yeah. then he became God, didn't he? Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a, definitely a promotion for him. <laughs> Because, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it turned out that was his calling because science fiction writing, not so much. Yeah. All right. No, I haven't read any of it. It isn't that good, eh? I heard it wasn't no. very good, but, you know, you would know that being a connoisseur be... of books. Yeah, uh, I was, it was very, I should not have been reading it. I think, I think that was a book that, at about 10, I should not have been reading, less. I should have been reading that book less than I should have been reading the um, Warlords of Gore series. Right. <laughs> and that that was you know quite horny but the 
Edward Hubbard's books were very mean spirited. They were very, um, very mean spirited, very petty, very unpleasant. They were just a very unpleasant read for me. Um, I don't think all of them are like that. I know some people really enjoy some of his other ones, but the book I read was just extremely unpleasant. So I just sort of went, well, no more of that. Right. Because Stone the Crows, it's kind of, well, you know, it's a love story. It's yes. also about, well, shapeshifters, shall we say? I don't want to give too much away. I don't want to give too much away. But it's also, could it be described as a horror as well? It's a little bit. Um, I, on the first book in the series, Dog Days, my editor came back with a question. You know, Can you really call this an urban fantasy? There's an awful lot of gore in it. So I was like, it counts. But it, there's, there's horror elements there, I think. Um, I think horror horror and fantasy very much go hand in hand a lot of the time. Yes. It's yeah. just it's just sort of the, the level of where you come in with it. And again, like I said, when I was a kid, I wanted I read all of the myth uh, all of the myth books, you know, the Vikings, Thor, Odin, everything like that, the Celtic gods, I loved them all and that very much informed Stone the Crows. It's it's I, a lot set in Scotland. I do think it's very much a, a sort of an Irish Celtic type, a Celtic thing, um, yeah. vibe to it. You know, the atmosphere, yeah. the yeah. approach that the wolves have to the the unnatural world and the world around them is very much sort of set in sort of Celtic mythology and that sort of. Um, yeah, and the relationship with the grand, the 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 now deceased grandmother, but the the. Um, the foretelling kind of, you know, you know, these the, something that he thought were myths. Well, it turns out yeah. not so much myths. <laughs> you know, this is what she was warning you about all this time, and it turns out to yeah. be quite real. Because um, it is, you know, in places quite dark, but it's a story that just keeps on giving just when you think, okay, it's settling in now. There's another bang. There's another twist. <laughs> you know, there's another. There's another shock. Really, I I would say that that has to be dealt with, yeah. And you mentioned the book set in Scotland. Why did you pick Scotland rather than Northern Ireland? I know it's all a Celtic thing, but you could have set it well, anywhere in that part of the world. Yeah, well, I actually wrote the first book in the series Dog Days when I was living in Newcastle, and okay. I was working at the Durham um, the Durham Book Festival there. Um, so I was back and forth there, and it was sort of you know, later on in the year. And I was absolutely livid because the year before they'd had an absolute white Christmas and they were every all the people I was working with had all been at the Durham Book Festival. There'd been snow everywhere. Durham is the most beautiful university town. It was where Harry Potter was filmed, part of Harry Potter was filmed there. And it was right. covered in snow the year before. And I was there and all I got was rain. I could have got rain stayed here. <laughs> so I wrote dog days with the icy end of the world from sheer but it's a nice thing. <laughs> white Christmas. But so. that's a really important part of the book because the weather, the severe snowstorm that, that we're introduced to at the very beginning of the book, that almost becomes as important as any of the characters, doesn't it? Where did that yeah. influence? Was was did you did you? I mean, was that an original idea of yours, or, or was was there another book you you've read or so you've heard about and it influenced you and thought, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have that as an integral thing threaded through and the challenges involved in that? No, and it's just in the, the first book in the series. As I started to write it, um, I hadn't really thought that the the weather was going to have such a sort of mind of its own because there's a there's a spitefulness to the weather you can yeah there's times where it feels you know like it's its own it's having its own sort of meanness towards them um but just as i was writing the car the way the characters reacted to the weather and the, the sort of the way the narrative was pushing it you sort of realized that the weather was a character in itself um yeah it was a form of a god really that was yeah. that wanted something and it wanted to end to freeze the whole world to just in case everything and it viewed these little warm-blooded creatures running around as a sort of a challenge. Yeah. So, and I, and I, I really... We... Sorry, what were we going to say? I really enjoyed writing the sort of the extremes of the weather because it was such a tactile um, thing to write because you, you can say it's cold outside, but to really sort of 
explain how cold it is, the, that, that this is more than just a storm. You sort of, yeah, it has to be what people feel, you know, it has to be what they see, the the carnage that it has left behind, as you sort of see early on in the book. Yeah. Um, a bit mean to say it, I suppose, considering I did some quite horrible things to people, but it was it was really interesting to write and to sort of delve into that. <laughs> I mean, you did. I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't want to give too much away, but you know, y- you give children a hard time. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it really is quite. You know, it's it's brutal. Um, you know yeah, what the weather does I, to people, and the way the way in any circumstance when people are, are in that survival mode, <laughs> the, the the humans become um, almost animalistic, even though <laughs> there are you know wolves and and things in the in the book but the 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 ordinary rank and file people who find themselves in this situation uh, they're so desperate that we really get down to the basics of human survival and it isn't pretty yeah no i i did want to sort of yeah because part of the one of the things i wanted to explore with the um the shapeshifters in stone the crows is of the series is that the problems that they have and the the violence and the aggression, you know, all of the sort of the darker plot elements don't come from the wolf. Yes. The wolf has nothing to do with that. That's the pe- that's the human element coming through. The, yeah. the wolf is just a beast. It yes. might kill you, but there's no, you know, there's no meanness in that. There's no spite or It's just survival. Yeah. It's just yeah. to survive. Yeah. It's, the, it's from the, the human element that the, the needs and the wants and the darker thoughts come into the... The, yeah. that world so for true evil you need humans <laughs> i think so because you know i have two dogs and they can be a right pain of the ass at times but they don't mean to be they're just reacting no. instinctively to things and it's yeah. the same thing you know any dog you see that there's you know when they're out in the park or anything like that they just react instinctively to things they don't plan ahead they don't yeah. hold grudges they don't have yeah. anything like that it's it's only, you know, the owners that bring those elements in. So. Yeah, I think the, the main difference between dogs and people is dogs totally live in the moment. Mm. And humans are worried about the future and affected by their past. And you know, mm. But dogs are just right there in that moment. Uh, and yes, there isn't a past or a future. It's just about right now. Yeah. Mm. So where did the characters come from? I mean, well, the human, uh, humans and the wolves, I suppose. But where did the characters come from? I probably shouldn't admit this, but um, first of all, uh, Gregor was supposed to die in the first book. Was he? Well, I, well, actually, through the book, though, you don't know if he's going to make it anyway. Uh, so, yeah, right. There's, there's a, he has a hard time, but there, in the first book, he was very much the anti- it was very much part of the, the antagonistic elements of it, and he was yeah. supposed to die. And it was a moderately, you know, heroic death, but he was supposed to die. And I got to that point during the, the first edit, and I was like, and he's such a good character, and the the rivalry he has with his brother is so much a part of both of them, because they are very much sort of two, ha- two halves of one whole, um, yeah. that I thought, no, I need to keep him. So he, he survived into book two, and then um, Danny was, I spent ages trying to come up with the character that for the, 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 the sort of his uh, love interest and none of them were clicking and then I realized it was because Daddy had no idea what was going on and that's where his heroism and his part of it because he doesn't know what's going on but he's still doing his best and, and that's when the characters click for me right and, and the, the story itself where did the idea for that come because it it goes on quite a journey the story oh. the story you know, by the end of the book, we're in a totally different place to where we were at the beginning. So there, there's a lot of movement in the story. Mostly the, the whole, I, I'm very much a pantser, but the whole story element sort of was birthed from the fact that Gregor needed to lose something. No, not too many spoilers, but he needed to lose something that was so important to him and then find out that maybe it wasn't so important, that maybe he was more than what he had lost, yeah. um, which you know, feeds into the next the next book. Um, yeah. So the whole series was, came from that with 
gaining things and losing things and and sort of what can you live without mm -hmm. which is very much what was um sort of pushing the human elements of uh, the story was pushing yeah. them for which is can i live without these things that i'm i'm on the verge of losing because I felt when I was reading it that Gregor became more human the more the book went on. Would that yes. be was that would that be fair to say, or and was that deliberate? Yeah, it, was, it was. Yes, um, Gregor in book one was very much um, the 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 prototype of the the wolf. He was the the platonic ideal that the the wolves in the series have of who they are and who they want to be. He was very connected to the, to his wolf side to the magic, to the to the world around him. And he was extremely proud of that. And he thought it made him better than the rest of the the rest of the wolves, his brother, everybody. And it, you know, and then he sort of had to explore what it meant to be just Gregor and not Gregor who was this wolf powered by the wild. So who he was without without the, the backing of his his pack. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, book one, book two. For anyone that doesn't know, because I haven't put it on the screen here, maybe I should have done, <laughs> that this is the, the Wolf Winter books, and this is book yeah. two. How many oh, no. Wolf Winter books are there? Uh, there's three. It's a trilogy. It is a trilogy. And they and oh. everything is wrapped up in the three, or is it a potential oh, yeah. for four? It is. No, everything, it's... Everything's wrapped up in three. I mean, I could return to the, the world, but the whole sort of the storyline... Yeah. So the three books was was um, wrapped up very. I think it was wrapped up very well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I haven't read three, so uh, who knows? Oh, how sorry. did you oh, find? Sorry. How did you find the experience of turning book two, Stone the Crows, into an audio book? Because you've done a lot of audio books before with other narrators, but on this one, how did you find the experience? It was. It was really. Uh, it was great. Well, <laughs> there was a lot going on in my personal life at the time, so it, it kept putting off. Listening to the um, to the auditions because there were seventy five of them. I was like, "Wow, it's going to take forever! It's going to take me so long to go through these." And I kept putting it off, and then one day I just sat down, put my headphones on, and I, I looked my narrator in to sort of get some second opinions on it. And I was going through and making the wee list of no, yes, no, maybe, maybe, maybe. And I sent it to her, but there was your name at the bottom, and I was like, "I think it's this one. I think it's this one." <laughs> Well, I'm so glad you chose me, Tammy. It was a it was a wonderful book to read because it's uh, it's very atmospheric. the The weather plays a huge part in it, uh, and to try and get the feeling of the cold, uh, I I know I I had a, a few goes at getting that and a few different ways of doing that, and I think I got there in the end. I don't know, but uh, and the characters are just so wonderful, and the story just keeps on giving out. And uh, it was it was just one. So thank you so much for choosing me. Thank you so much for for you know really that I I really loved your voice. I loved it. I loved it. Sort of, it was it was rough, but it wasn't rough. It was there was a grittiness to it, but there was there was heart and soul in it. I, I just thought it was brilliant. Oh, it was lovely to do. It was lovely to do. So the website to find out more about you is tamorights.com. And there's a link to that if you're watching this on YouTube. tamorrights.com. There's links to everything everything else on that. There also in the link if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link to the audiobook through Amazon and uh, you can get everything there. So so what is next for TA More? Uh, well, I've just released a contemporary which is called Footwork. So it just went out on Sunday yesterday. What's it, it called? Footwork. Okay. Yeah. It's a standalone contemporary. And then next month on the 4th of October, I've got an urban fantasy um, set in Ohio. <laughs> so, Sting in the Tail is that, that's that part of the Carnival of Mysteries series, which is there's a, um, the Carnival of Mysteries is like a mysterious carnival and it turns up in every book. And there's 13, 13 books. Wow. And so, so the carnival has a has a, a sort of a starring role in each book, and that's what ties the whole series together. There's all different worlds and different authors, and oh, there's some amazing authors in it, some brilliant books. I was really intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, check that out. And of course, there are links there. There are links there in in TA More Rights. It's all on the website there. Yeah, everything's on there. Um, and there's some freebies as well, some free stories and um, free audio uh, short stories as well, so that people can yeah. listen to them. It's all good stuff. And also, the one to get is get the Wolf Winter series. Stone the Crows yeah. is book two. I was lucky enough to be chosen to do that, and I had an, uh, although Love it was it. a dark book, I had an amazing amount of fun doing it because uh, <laughs> some of it's really over the top. It's really over the top. So uh, I hope you can check that out. Tammy, thank you very much once again. Thank you as well, Graham. Thank you for having me. It was uh, lovely to chat.